talk about my interview yesterday with uh, Mark Morial since nobody's listening. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to go I'm going to go through that. And I I want to um I'd love to hear from you. I've gotten many many messages. I'm going to read an email that I received cuz people be reaching me in many different ways and then they don't expect me to respond and I do. Uh <laughs> so yeah. And that goes for, you know, disgruntledness, folk in the comments, you wherever you reach me, if I see it, I'm going to say something because I'm that person. But I got an email from a brother. Uh, his name is Richard. And that's all I'll, I'll say. Richard, he said, good morning. I wanted to address the representative that you had on from the Urban League yesterday. It wasn't just a representative. He was CEO and president. OK, Mr. Richard, he wasn't just a rep. He said, I found I find that he was a bit abrasive. When he was talking to you and your audience, I even heard you try to explain to him the type of audience you have, and he still refused to listen. At this stage in my life, because of my physical disabilities, I didn't get out much, but I still want to help with my community. I've been blessed to have the finances to do so. However, this man made me put my wallet back in my pocket. He said, I was born in the 60s. My parents are still living. And for him to say that people living now haven't experienced those issues in the past was a bit appalling. Most of all, people you bring to the table are good. You might have to start putting a disclaimer to your shady guests not to insult the intelligence of your listeners and their abilities to support the cause. Let me just pause there. Um, I think I do put out a disclaimer. <laughs> I think I tell people don't know that you're not going to find this audience anywhere because it's behind a paywall. So if you go on the breakfast club, God bless, do that. But that's not this audience. And, and we may watch the breakfast club. I'm not disparaging it from that standpoint, but that's not where we're, you know, we're convening to get stuff done. That's entertainment, you know? So this audience is different than the audience you will even find watching the view. There may be some crossover, but by and large, this is an audience that I don't think many people can find. And it's vast. It's powerful and it's, you know, it's us. It's all of the ranges of us. It's not even monolithic. So coming in here, you're going to find conservatives. You know, we got Sher Michael on this channel as well. Sher Michael Singleton, who is a gun toting, uh, weight lifting, dyed in the wool, old school conservative, as a lot of you are, but you just can't abide by the racism which most of us cannot. So this is why we are in solidarity around the issues of justice and freedom for all. So uh, I digress though. He said, as a former US, dr US Army drill sergeant, I want to put my jump boot, I wanted to put my jump boot in the crack of his assets. <laughs> he, he went on uh, and he said, love the show respectfully, Mr. Richard, uh, I won't give his last name, but um, I too, you know, I was sitting there because uh, coming in, you know, despite, what I say on these airwaves. And usually I'm talking broadly, you know, like if I'm talking about the urban league, I'm talking, I'm not getting specific and it's not personal. It's broadly like the foundation of this organization is to provide resources and um, provisions for mostly for businesses in, in urban communities, right? Mostly black communities. And when I brought up Whitney Young, I was surprised too at the reaction because Whitney Young was putting together programs to educate folk who had dropped out of school to help people with buying homes. And I'm like, you know, we can build on those programs, not toss them away because they happened in the 50s and 60s. And then I brought up Wells Fargo. So I want to spend a little time with Wells Fargo today because I did that on purpose because here's how I look at it. Wells Fargo is a proxy. So Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citibank, all of the banks conspired for at least, I want to say, four or five years once they figured out that they could do this to deliver loans to people that they previously would not give, give loans to. And these were called subprime loans. And the loans came with hev heavier interest rates. They came with balloon payments. They came with a lot of things that were buried in the red tape and in the small print that would create a problem if, God forbid, the market crashed. Well, guess what? 2007, the market crashed. The housing market crashed. The bubble burst. And what ended up happening is that a whole lot of people, mostly Black and Hispanic, lost their wealth, lost their homes. 
And if you were able to hold on to your home, you were underwater, which means that you couldn't pull money out of your home, which means you couldn't get a HELOC anymore because all of the loans were locked down, a, a home equity line of credit. You were in a situation where now you're living in something that is not a, not valuable at all. Usually your home is a is a thing that you can use to leverage, and it is something that over time can be used to build legacy. But because of this predatory lending, and this is, I read the Washington Post and Bloomberg, I did a little homework, uh, Black people, and I'm going to give these numbers because it's stunning. Black people alone, because of the subprime lending debacle, estimated to have lost between 72 and $93 billion. 72 to $93 billion. More people lost homes and or didn't have homes as a result of this than even the 40s, 50s, 60s, even, you know, like, like home ownership in the black community under Bush even was, you know, was a was a great thing. We lost more wealth during that period of time because of the the way in which we were targeted. In the Washington Post article, uh, they talked about it being a reverse redlining. They said banks that once ignored minority communities were now targeting them to make money, a practice that was bitterly referred to as reverse redlining. So redlining is uh, there's a neighborhood that's white, so-called white, and a black person has the money, the means and whatever to move into it. But they were like, nah, you can't live here. Here's where you can live. So there's literally a red line around certain communities that black people could get entry into. So what would happen is often sometimes a black person would have a white friend as a proxy or a white lawyer or a white accountant go buy the home for them. And I think about that to this day, you know, when my parents moved into East Orange, there were the, we bought a home for from a white person. And I remember the home was beautiful, but I also remember the first day and I was four years old. And I remember it like it was yesterday because the people who had lived there burned holes in the carpet so that we couldn't use it. They they scratched up the floors like they they left. Uh, their mark on the home that was previously pristine because they didn't want to sell to black people. And then soon all of the white people moved out of the neighborhood. So by the time I was growing up, five, six, seven, the whole neighborhood was, was black. There was only one white lady, Miss Bucky on the corner. Um, By the, by the time I was 10, Miss Bucky was there until she died. And I tried to buy her home and my father wouldn't help me, but that's another story for another day. That said, at 21, I wanted to buy her house because she had passed away. And I was like, hey, I could live down the street from y'all. And he was like, mm -mm, I, ain't, I ain't helping you do that. So um, I say all of that to say redlining was a real thing. And what it did ostensibly was create ghettos, uh, create spaces where the insurance companies, everybody is complicit, right? So you're going to charge more for insurance. You're going to charge more for car insurance, home insurance, because it's a, it's a black neighborhood. The schools are, are rated lower because it's a black neighborhood. And it's really not true, you know? But if you think about wealth in the sense of people being able to keep money, being charged more to live in a place is unconscionable. The taxes in East Orange, where I grew up, were way more, way more than the taxes even in the neighboring town that might have been predominantly white. So there's a tax on being black. And then you couple that with banks coming after black people who they would not give regular ass loans to. And I'm someone that had a subprime loan with a piggyback. So I'm not speaking out of the left corner of my right butt cheek. I'm talking from experience. I had more than a 750 credit score. I did not deserve to have a subprime loan with a piggyback, but I didn't know any better. So it is not a, you know, a, a fault of yours. If you have one of these loans, it doesn't mean that you're dumb. It doesn't mean anything other than you were preyed upon by a system that was designed to, to not do that. So Wells Fargo, one of the most egregious, they, uh, I think 2020, 2019, uh, might've been 2020. They had to pay a fine. Um, let me get to the fine. They paid a $2.1 billion fine to settle the allegations. Oh, that was for, yeah, for selling subprime mortgages. Um, actually, their $2.1 billion was a smaller fine than that paid by Bank, Bank of America, by J.P. Morgan Chase, by Goldman Sachs. So they were all in it, right? And I only bring up Wells Fargo because they stay in our faces. They constantly are in our faces. And they're in many ways more egregious because they're not the biggest among them. Uh, they were the last remaining bank to settle. Nobody went to jail. Not a Richard Kovacevic, who was part of it, 
2001 to 2009, he was the CEO of Wells Fargo, might still be hovering there somewhere, he still has a role in the bank, credited with pushing this whole concept. He didn't go to jail, but we lost between 72 and $93 billion in wealth, and it's not coming back, right? So I bring this up with, with Mark Morial yesterday, not in detail. I was going there, by the way, because they just cut a deal. They announced a deal, a $5 million grant created uh, they created something called the Diverse Appraisal Initiative, which we had a call, a call up yesterday saying that she went through, uh, I believe I forgot what city or state she was in, but she got her appraisal. And this is important. And I'm not saying Wells Fargo shouldn't pay back, but I'm asking the question from this standpoint. If you are in community with these companies because they come to you because under the guise that you speak for all black people, when they make a deal with Urban League or NAACP, which they also made a deal, $50 million grant they gave, Wells Fargo gave to the NAACP uh, to help organization to help the organization continue its efforts and to achieve racial equality. But that $50 million is not going to make up for the 72 or 93 billion stolen from us. And by making a deal with a, a Urban League or NAACP $50 million, you have basically given Wells Fargo the pat on the back that it's all good. And so I asked the initial question, you're in the room with Vice President Kamala Harris, you're in the room with President Joe Biden, you're in the room, what's the conversation? Because if it's not a list of the things now, each organization, National Action Network was there, so, so Al Sharpton at the table. If it's not a list of what your individual organization is going to bring back to the community, and we should all be in on that, by the way, whether we're members or not, right? Because your money is being given to you under the guise that you are representing all of us. Then if there's not a laundry list of things that we need to get done, and if I ask you what are, what are the things that you're proud of, what are the things you need to get done, what are the things that you envision getting done, and they were my last question is always, if you're given a magic wand, what would you like to see happen? I never got to that. But if you don't even have a list, <laughs> then how are you holding anyone accountable? And I, I'm not even going to fault Wells Fargo, President Biden, or or anyone, because if I'm in a room with somebody, and they don't ask me for anything. Even President Barack Obama said that. Make me do it. So when LBJ told King to wait, don't do this march. You know, wait. We don't need these. These. You know, it's it's too much. You know, with the passage of these bills, we don't we don't need civil rights just yet. Just wait. King said, No, I'm not waiting. I'm not waiting. You can't tell me to wait. My people demand justice. Justice delayed is justice denied. I think that was the quote, right? So. If King was like, nah, I'm not doing that. If Adam Clayton Powell was like, no, nah, we're going to get this done. All right, I'll take a back seat. You can sit there with the white senators from Texas or whatever, make it happen. But it happened. Head Start, Medicaid, all of that. Adam Clayton Powell did that from pressure in the room. If you have access in the room and all you walk away with is a check for yourself, that's a problem. And if you're called on it and you don't have a viable answer, then there there needs to be a response from outside, 866-801-8255. And if anyone who is sitting on this side of the mic, talking to anyone on that side of the mic, I'm not happy to, hell, I'll do three hours with just the audience every day. I don't really need to even have guests on the show. But if you agree to come on the show, then I would think you're used to being asked questions. And if you've never been asked questions, then I'm really looking at quote unquote media right now. Then I hear he's asked tough questions and he never gets bristly. Okay, so maybe it's me. I don't know you, sir. I have full full disclosure. I sat with him. He co-hosted with me about 20-something years ago when I had a four-hour morning show on a station called WWRL in New York City. It is uh, It was a New York AM station. He was my co-host. He probably doesn't remember it because, you know. And then I've seen him out. Sharpton, uh, Al Sharpton had a birthday party. I, I showed up to that. He was there. I said hello to him. So I don't think he he does, like doesn't know. We don't travel in the same circles, of course. But that doesn't even matter. I'm here. I'm not here to do anybody's bidding other than yours. People listening. I'm just here to ask questions. It's what I've been trained to do. So if you're not prepared to ask questions, you should deny the interview. Don't come on the show. And I say that with my full chest. There are a lot of people that won't come on the show. <laughs> 
There are a lot of people. Everybody's been invited, by the way. <laughs> a lot of people say no. They don't come on the show. Why? Because I'm going to ask questions. And that's to speak volumes. And I'm going to start to, you know, do a list of this person was asked to come on and they're not coming on. I wonder why. I wonder why. Do you not want to be asked questions? Listen, no one should get a free ride if you want to serve us. If you want my vote, you want my donation, you want my support. I think we should be able to ask questions. And I'm not even the person that's standing in in the gap. I I want to say today, shout out to Cornell West because he took every caller. He stayed and took every caller. That's somebody, I mean, I got to respect that. I ain't vote for him. But I, I'm like, I respect a man that's going to sit there, took every question and answered every caller because he wants your vote. That's what that's supposed to look like, by the way. 866-801-8255. Some of y'all were not convinced, but at least you had an opportunity to talk to the man who wants your vote. This is why we have these platforms. Call in and all of that. So I just I'm incredibly disappointed um, by yesterday's um, I can't even call it an interview. And, uh, you know, those those of you who tune in every day, you know, uh, uh, I can be really you know, kind of tough, but I, w- I wasn't because I literally came in. I was like to myself, here's an opportunity. You know, I've been saying some things. I'm sure he's heard things I've been saying. So let's address them if you want to. I'm here. I, it ain't nothing I'm afraid to, to talk about even checking me. Right. But if we are going to have a conversation, maybe we could build something afterwards because this ain't personal. I don't know you. And like I said, I didn't. Cheap shot would have been talking about a whole lot of things that I'm not going to talk about. Some of y'all looked up the salary, by the way. I'm just saying. And not just his salary, because I went in, because this is all public public record, which is why when I asked about how much money you got from the federal government, you know that number. Stop playing with us. You know the number because the number's out there. You're publicly traded. You're not publicly traded. You are a nonprofit. Yes, you do have to report. You have an audit, and it's on your website buried in the thousands of pages but i did want to hold up one because somebody sent it to me y'all out there doing reporting work and i love it i love it somebody sent me the columbus ohio urban league uh nonprofit. spent seven hundred fifty thousand dollars or more in federal grants um in fiscal year 2022 According to the audit, they brought in a sum total of seven million four hundred thousand nine hundred seventeen dollars and they spent six point nine million, three point five million of those were in wages and salaries. Those numbers are out there. Do the math. If you're going to donate or support, you have the right to ask, where's my money going? Somebody even said that, you know, oh, uh, they came in a narrative. Oh, I know Karen's using that money. Karen doesn't even take a salary from Narrative or Nubia or The Hub. <laughs> no, I don't. On purpose, because it's a The Hub's a nonprofit. I'm not taking a dime from that. First of all, I don't need to. Thank God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But, but number two, I want this, these things to be around. Me taking a big salary it doesn't help me build the thing that I want to see. Because I'm not doing it for the money. Thank God. I don't have to. But yeah, it's a valid question and I'm going to answer it, you know, but don't make any assumptions. If you ask me, I'm going to get the answer to you. Okay. 866-801-8255. I love us. I love us. I love us. Let's go to the phones. Uh, let's bring Marie in. Marie from Texas. Hi. I'm not, he- I'm not really here this hour. So shh, don't tell okay. anybody. Don't tell hey, nobody. hey, Karen. You know what? I was on the computer as you were speaking to Mark Mariel and I hope he's listening, but I was like offended and I stopped dead in my tracks from donating. That's what I stopped because you didn't answer. He didn't answer any of your questions. And I literally, as you were asking him to walk you through, I was online with you and I was one click away from pushing donate. And when his attitude changed, I said, no, I'm done. I can find another organization to give my money to. But that's the or that he gave off. And I hope he's listening to your show today because I'm not the only person that felt that way. OK, so I just my my spirit, it was just in my. No, that's all. Karen, I love you. You did a great job. But he just stopped me. Literally, I was one click away. And when his attitude changed, I said, I'm done. Brother, just answer the question. Just answer the questions for Karen. Because we pay to listen to you. And I think the listening audience were very astute. But he literally stopped me from from donating. 
Yeah, I hope, I hope he's listening too. You know, um, I feel like in in our community, and again, because I sit in a lot of seats and I've been in a lot of rooms and I've been in a lot of rooms quiet. People may not have seen me there, but I've been there. I've been there, may have been there with a notepad from the Daily News. I may have been there with a microphone from RL back in the day, but I've been I've been in the rooms, you know. And what I notice is there's, there's this um, there's a very clicky. It's a weird it's a weird thing. Like if people don't like you for whatever reason. Then it's kind of like, you know, but then don't come on the show because I don't care whether I like you or not. I'm going to ask the questions and get the information because if, if your organization can help people get from point A to point B, damn it, I'm supporting it. I ain't got to like you. And that's the other thing that really, really bothers me um, in leadership. You know, there's a very it's a very clicky crony you know friend and, and i even look at here you know and and the team we put together it is put together based on merit <laughs> it's put together based on work ethic there are people on my team i cannot i don't even not this personal this personal team i actually like everybody but there are people on some other teams that i'm on i don't like them but they're valuable so i'm, I'm damn well you know i may not hang out and have a beer with them because i don't drink beer but None of that matters. Are we here to get a job done? Yes, we are. Let's get the job done, damn it. We ain't got time for all of this. So I, I appreciate you, Marie. Sorry that they didn't get their donation, but I'm asking this question too, like for the money, and y'all got a lot of federal funds in, in addition to Mackenzie Scott money and Wells Fargo money. And there's probably a laundry list of corporations and donations. And this is the other question that I have. If you take money from a Wells Fargo and you don't hold them accountable, can we trust you? Can we trust you? And I'm 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 use myself again. You know, we have one united, one united is part of our family, right? First couple of times we've had uh when when Terry first came on, y'all called up, y'all had some problems with one united. <laughs> this is before she was advertising. Y'all had some problems. We took every call, but she stood in that, took every call. I would get emails from people who had problems with that. I would send her the email. You know what? She responded to each and every email. She did that Harriet Tubman thing. I called her up that day and I said, listen, um, you know, I love and respect you, but, you know, we may need to sever our relate. You know, maybe we don't do this anymore. And she said, can I come on the show and explain my, my reasoning? I still to this day don't agree with her. But we had a conversation about it. She came on the show. We talked about it. And she still rocks with us, even though I was like, I don't like this and I'm never going to promote this Harriet Tubman thing. She was like, that's fine, you know, because we're adults, mature. She 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 loves this audience. We love her support here. It allows us to do the things because y'all know I don't get a salary from Sirius XM either. I work at your behest. The support that you provide to these advertisers to provide me with enough to go and then build other shows. So it wasn't even just about me either. I sell it is to say, how do you hold people accountable? Yes, I could have easily said, well, when United is giving us money, I can't say nothing. I got to just go along with this Harriet Tubman thing, but I didn't agree with it. And if you don't have enough, I think it's called integrity to say, I may be getting money from you, but this doesn't line up with, with, with where I'm going or what I'm doing here or with this show. And, it, and at least I had a partner that's like, okay, I, you know, I'm still this is my decision. I like it. And we can agree to disagree because guess what? Doesn't mean we, we still can't rock together and do some things. And we, that was, what was that? Three, four years ago, still here. So I'm just saying, you know, even if you're going to take Wells Fargo money, I need to see some Wells Fargo accountability. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that needs to be public. <laughs> She smiles and says that she loves me Isn't it lovely when the one who loves things is the one